Hello, my name is Scott Grizzard. This is Calculus One. I'm from the University of South Florida. Uh, last time we talked about the basic derivative rules, and today we're going to talk about uh, the product rule and then proofs with rabbits, because we're going to use a rabbit to prove the product rule. Hold it right there. So, uh, why do we have such a, a, a rule, anyway? So, what is the product rule? Well, let's say I'm taking... Uh, the derivative of x squared times x cubed. Now, any, you know, any intelligent person would immediately go, this is the derivative of x to the fifth, right? You add the exponents, you get the derivative of x to the fifth, you use a little power rule here, and you get 5x to the fourth. But let's look instead at this x squared x cubed thing. Now, if I just took the derivative of the products and multiplied them together, notice that that would be 2x times 3x squared. And that does not equal this, right? So if I did this wrong, it would be 2x times 3x squared, which equals 6x cubed, which does not equal 5x to the fourth. So I can't just multiply the two derivatives together right? It's incorrect. Instead, I have to use the product rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of the first, and I'm going to multiply it by the second without the derivative, just the original second. Then I'm going to add the derivative of the second, I'm sorry, the, 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 the original function times the derivative of the second. So it's the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And what I wind up with then, if I do that, is 2x times x cubed plus x squared times 3x squared, and that would give me my 5x to the fourth. So let's state this rule. Uh, in prime notation, it would be stated as a theorem. And you would state it as follows. Let f and g be functions. If f prime exists and g prime of x exists, then f times g prime of x exists, and f times g prime of x is f prime of x times g of x plus f of x times g prime of x. Or you would say this last rule as the following. The derivative with respect to x of fg of x is the derivative with respect to x of uh, f of x times g of x, the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. You can also state the entire rule again in 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 lightness notation. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think you want it. I do, I do. Give it to me. And it says that if the derivative of both exists, then the derivative of the product exists, and the derivative of the product is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Ah, oh, poor fella. Uh -huh. Yeah, ain't I a stinker? So let's look at a few examples. So I've got here's the one I mentioned before: the derivative with respect to x of x squared times sine of x. Now, let's look at the journey of x on this problem, okay? x starts, and remember x is where I input the variable, right? So think about x as a two. What happens to the two in this equation here? Well, the first thing that happens on the left is it's going to get squared. So the journey of x is a squaring, right? But here I'm gonna take the sine of two. Likewise, if the input was pi, I'd put in a pi squared and a sine of pi. Now, when I do this, after I evaluate x squared or pi squared and sine and uh, sine of pi, I'm then going to multiply them together. So the last thing that happens here is a product. So when I evaluate the derivative, I'm going to move up. Okay, so this right here is a product. That's the last thing that happens. So now I'm going to move up. The last thing that happens was a product, so I'm going to apply the product rule. I'm going to take the derivative of the first times the second plus the second uh, first times the derivative of the second. And then when I take the derivative here, I'm going to get 2x. I carry down the sine. I've got an x squared that I carry down. And then I'm going to take the derivative of sine of x to get cosine of x. Likewise, if I do the derivative of 2 to the x cosine of x, the last thing that happens is this product. That's the last thing that happens to x. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the product rule to break it up. I'm going to have the derivative of 2 to the x times cosine of x plus 2 to the x times the derivative of cosine of x. 
Now I evaluate the derivatives here, and then I'm gonna simplify a little bit by moving that negative out. And I don't have to do that. This is a valid answer, but I just felt like it, right? It's a negative, it's in there. Um, and I'm just gonna take it out. That's a dot, by the way, that's not a, make that a little clearer. That's a dot, not a minus sign. Okay. All right, well, let's look at another situation. Suppose I have two functions defined by their graphs, okay? And here they are. There's f there, and there's g there, okay? And what I want to do is I want to compute f g prime of x. Now, real fast, let's see what f g of x is. This is just on the side, right, of 1. So f g of 1 equals the the f of 1 times g of 1. And f of 1 here equals 1. And g of 1 equals negative 1. So we wind up with negative 1. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to compute the derivative of fg prime. I'm sorry, I want to create the, compute the derivative of fg at 1. So this is the same as computing. I want to compute d um, fg of dx at x equals 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the power, the product rule, right? The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And then I just plug in the numbers. So f prime of 1 is 1 half. g of 1 is negative 1 plus f of 1, which again is 1, and, F, and g prime of 1, which is 2. And I know this because here the slope is 2 over 1 up. And here the slope is 1 over 2 up, right? There's the slope of the tangent line. The dotted line there is the tangent line. So when I, I, I compute this here, I get 3 halves. Okay, so those are a few examples. Thanks. I needed that. So let's look at the intuition behind the product rule. Um, I've seen this presentation a number of times. Um, one of the best with animation as well of this uh, rule, there's a video that I've linked below uh, for three blue, one brown, who has absolutely the best visual presentation of the product rule. Um, and it's just, it's absolutely phenomenal. I can't match his animation, but I'm gonna try to explain it here um, as well. And watch that video also. Again, it's linked in the description below. Uh, but this is the way that the intuition works behind it. So what I'm going to do is I've got y equals u times v. So I can think of y as the area u times v. Okay. Now, y is a function of, of, of x. u is a function of x and v is a function of x. So both of these things are going to move a little as I move x. Okay. So let's, and what I want, so what I want is dy. I want the change in area. So what I want here is the change in area when I nudge x a little bit. So let's nudge x a little bit. Now, when I nudge x, it's going to move v, okay? And it's going to move v out just a little bit, All right? So nudging x is going to nudge v. And nudging x is also going to nudge u. And so what I want is dy, okay? I want the change in area when I nudge x. So the total area changes. I've got a little rectangle here. I've got a little kind of square bit here, a rectangle. And then I've got a rectangle right here. So what I want when I nudge y, what I want is this entire area. So when I nudge y, just when I nudge x, it's going to nudge v and nudge u. And then so together, because y equals u times v, that's going to nudge y in both directions, right? I'm going to have a total nudge in y, right? My total nudge in y is the effect caused by the nudge in v plus the effect of the nudge in u plus a little bit here, the nudge in both. Now, this right here, the area of this bit here is u, the height, 
times dv. And the area here is du, the height, times v. And then this area here is du dv. So I've nudged v and I've nudged u a little bit. And what I have is a corresponding nudge in y. Okay, now let's look at what this happens. Let's say u equals 2, v equals 3, and I'm going to nudge x by 0.1. So I've nudged, uh, I end up uh, nudging u a little bit, and I end up nudging v. Likewise, when I nudge here at 0.01, a slightly smaller nudge in x, I'm going to get a change in u of this and a change in v of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get, this is my total change in area here. I've got the change in UV. Let me go ahead and do that here. So now my total highlighted area is dy. This right here is my nudge in U times V. This is my nudge in V times U, right? So this is the width, this is the height, and this is my nudge of nudge. Nudge times nudge. Now, if my nudge in X is 0 0.1, that's going to give me, let's say this right here is a nudge in Y. Both of these should have X's, by the way, after them. My nudge in Y here is going to be, you know, 0.2 times 3. I'm going to have a nudge in, I'm going to have a, 2 here times the point 0.3. And then I'm going to have a plus this 0 0.2 times 0 0.3. So this is going to be 0 0.6 plus 0 0.6 plus 0 0.06. And remember, I want to get infinitesimally small. Well, how small is that? As small as I want in my nudges. So my nudges can get really, 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 really tiny. As a matter of fact, they could get infinitesimally tiny. So when I add another zero to this thing, look what happens. I get a nudge here of 0 0.06 total, 0 0.06 again. But look how many zeros this thing gets, 0 0.0006. And as I get smaller and smaller in my nudge, this thing on the right is going to go to measureless dust. It's just going to nothing, OK? So what I get is I get dy equals du times v plus u times dv plus, eh, who cares, right? Something very, very, very small that's heading to zero very quickly compared to these other terms, right? This thing is heading to zero. This thing is adding two zeros for every zero I add to each of these terms, right? This thing's adding two zeros. This is getting very, very small very, very quickly. So what I have then is dy over dx equals du over dx times v plus u times dv over dx. Now, this isn't a proof, but that's the intuition about what's going on. So if someone asked me to show them, hey, how is the product rule actually working in calculus? I say, oh, let's look at this rectangle. It's not a proof, but it's a good, it's an explanation about what is going on and the intuition behind it. Wicked wits cry. So let's prove the product rule. Let's actually do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the limit definition of the derivative. And I'm going to leave some space because our strategy here is going to be a little bit longer. It'll be beautiful. Let's write down what the first line is going to be. The first line is going to be f dot g prime of x equals. OK, so all I did was I, I worked out this and remember that f times g of x plus h is f of x plus h times g of x plus h. So I just worked it out like this. Um, and then what I get here is I'm going to wind up here with this term. Now, this looks like our sum law. So remember our proof for the sum law. What I did was I had this step here. And then what I did was I separated it out. So I've done the exact same thing here. And then when I did this, I rearranged it, and then I, I, I separated using the sum. Okay? 
But I can't quite do that here. I'm sort of stuck. Well, let's go back to our model again of the sum rule. Sum rule. And we do note here when I did the sum rule that at the very end I had f prime of x plus g prime of x. And then my next line here was the definitions of what I had. So let's write that down. We're kind of stuck here, so let's write down what the last step should look like, right? It should look something like... So somewhere up here, I should have g of x times the limit. So somewhere, this is what the bottom of this proof would be. I don't know how to go from here to here, but somehow this should be the last line, right? I've got f prime of x times g of x. I'll probably write that with the g out front because, you know, it's a limit. So I'll probably have g of x times the definition of f. And I'm going to have f times the definition of g prime. I'm sorry, the definition of f prime plus f times the definition of g prime. How do I get from there to there? They are calling it a freeway. Let me show you how I get from there to there. Huh. What the? Well, what did I just add to the top? Add these two things together that I just add. I just added zero. That whole term on the top equals zero. What? Why would I do that? What's happened here is that some mathematician has come along and just pulled a rabbit out of his hat. Okay. This is what we call a rabbit. There is no earthly reason why this should occur to you. Okay. Why the heck have I just done that? Now, let's look at what happens if I do that. Now, let me group these terms and see what happens. Now that I've added this zero, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group these two terms. So all I did was split along the H, right? I mean, I split along the plus in the middle, and I split the fraction in two, right? Just like, you know, one plus one all over four is one fourth plus one fourth. Yeah, that's all I did. I just split the fraction. But now that I do that, look what happens to the individual pieces. I could factor out an F plus H here, and I could factor out a G of X here. Now that I've done that factoring, all I did is factored an f of x plus h from this, this, these two terms up front to here, and I factored a g of x from those two terms there and stuck them in front of the fractions. Right. Now this starts to look a little bit like the definitions of the derivative, right? That term is going to become g prime. That term is going to become f prime. This term is g. And this term is f is going to become f of x. Okay, so what I need to do here, so my ordering is going to be off, right? This term, this first term is going to become the f, and this term here is going to become the g. So now I need to do a little bit of that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up using the sum law. Then I'm going to pull this out with the constant multiple law, and I'm going to pull this out with the product law. Okay, so this one right here, the f of x plus h, these two limits, I know that the limit as h goes to zero of this exists, and I know that this one exists. And I know that those exist because f is differentiable, therefore it's continuous. And I know that this thing right here exists because g prime of x exists. Likewise, this right here, I should say product law, constant multiple law. This right here is a constant because there's no H in it, right? It's constant according to the limit. So the only piece, this right here is G prime of X. This right here is F prime of X. The order's off, but that's okay. We're adding, we're not subtracting. So the order, you know, we could find with flipping them around. 
how do I deal with this? Well, I already said it. This right here, let's just label these things. This right here becomes G prime. Now this right here, since F is continuous at X, I can actually directly substitute it in. I know that F is continuous because F is differentiable. So remember that the differentiability is a prudish atheistic white boy. Well, that makes him an atheistic white boy, right? If I'm differentiable, I'm also continuous. So, and I get a little neener neener for that. You know, that's a long one. So, when I'm writing my step here, this is a rabbit. But tell me, Eddie. Is that a rabbit in your pocket or you're just happy to see me? Now, if I'm reproducing this proof for a test or, you know, because it's, it's important, notice that I need this key argument. Now, again, we, don't ex we expect you to memorize this for the test. We don't expect in 20 years for, or 10 years for you to be sitting in a bar and a person of your preferred, a very attractive person of your preferred gender to walk up to you and say, I'll sleep with you if you can prove the, uh, the product rule for me. But I still got it, Eddie. Boop, boop, be -doo. <laughs> yeah, you still got it. However, there is a skill here, and that is taking a very complicated mathematical argument, or argument in general, picking out what pieces that you are the key pieces, and then summarizing that for yourself, and then being able to reconstruct it. And that's a key skill, and that's a skill we, we care about. So let's write a summary of this or our strategy for this, this, this proof. We're going to use the H definition of the derivative. And then we're going to add the rabbit to the top. Once we add the rabbit, we've got a factor and apply limit laws. And then the other little piece that we're probably going to have to memorize um, is the, what happens to this F of X plus H. So I'm going to write that in my introduction. So I'm just going to write that F is continuous. Why? Because it's differentiable. That's a little trick that I may need. And then, of course, I need to state what my rabbit is. This Roger, he keeps blowing his line. So a rabbit is a very clever zero that you add or a very clever one that you multiply. And you need that for this trick. This is called a rabbit. This is what I call a rabbit proof. I mean, it's not called a rabbit proof. Um, other instructors or other people are going to say that this is you know slightly different they're going to call them magic tricks or the trick i like the rabbit because it's just something that gets pulled out of your ass i mean your hat okay so that's how you prove the product rule makes perfect sense let's look at the other major rule for this section the quotient rule quotient rule is very similar to the product rule Okay, but I need an extra condition, and that's that the bottom does not equal zero. Now, if these three things are met, that means that f over g prime of x exists. And look at the formula here. I've got f prime of x times g of x minus f of x times g prime of x over g of x squared. So, for example, if I have the derivative of sine of x over x squared... I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wind up splitting that up. Um, sort of like the product rule, except there's a minus in here. And that's why I wanted you to memorize the, or, the product rule in a particular order. It doesn't really matter with the product rule because there's a sum. But here it matters because it's a difference. So it's the G prime that gets the negative. That's it. That's the connection. So it's F prime of X times G of X minus F of X times G prime of X over g of x squared, okay? So for example, here I've got sine of x over x squared, so this is the derivative of the top times x squared minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. And then there's your final answer. Now, the proof of the quotient rule, it's in your book, um, in that section on the product and quotient rule. <clears throat> what I want you to do for homework 
uh, for the quiz on Monday. You've been hanging around rabbits too long. There it is on the quiz of rabbit. I want the rabbits and only the rabbits for the following proofs. What's all this wee stuff? They just want the rabbit. It's the product on the quotient rule. So what you need to do is you need to go into your book, into the section in your book. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> You need to go to the section in your book and you need to read about the proof of the quotient rule. It's in there. And when you get to it, what I want you to do is I want you to find the rabbit. Okay, wise guy. Where's the rabbit? I haven't seen him. All right. And then the rabbit, you need to find the rabbit. And then the rabbit is going to be on your quiz on Monday or Tuesday, whenever you're taking the first quiz. Okay. So that's your homework for this section. See, there it is. Okay, find the rabbit, and then I want you to write an introduction to that proof. Did you find the rabbit? Don't worry, Judge. We got the formants all over the city. We'll find them. <laughs> now, we can use the quotient rule. Once we have it in our bag, we can actually use the quotient rule to prove some nice things. For instance, the derivative of tangent. So I want to show that the derivative of tangent of x is 1 over cosine squared of x, okay? Um, and there are, for secant, cosecant, and cotangent, uh, there are the variety of uh, trigonometric functions that you can have. Well, let's go ahead and just prove, using the quotient rule, that the derivative of tangent is 1 over cosine squared. I'm going to use the quotient rule, and then I'm going to use the Pythagorean identity. So, 1 over cosine squared. So, the tangent is sine over cosine, is equal to sine over cosine. So, I'm going to do the, the, the quotient rule here. I'm going to get the derivative of sine times cosine minus sine times the derivative of cosine, all over cosine squared. So, that's going to be cosine cosine minus sine minus sine, which is going to give me cosine squared plus sine squared over cosine squared. Well, I use the Pythagorean identity, I get 1 over cosine squared, and then I'm done. All right. You can also do the proofs. Uh, we'll do them on the problem set this week for cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Um, they're all similar. Okay, so that's what I have for you. Uh, we've got the product rule, the proof of the product rule, the quotient, and the quotient rule, and you've got a little assignment to go find the uh, rabbit in the quotient rule. Next time, we're going to look at the chain rule. Okay, that's what I have. Have a good day. And I'll see you next time. That's all, folks. <laughs>